Hello, church. My name is Zare. And on behalf of our church family, we want to take a moment and wish you a happy Canada Day. We hope you've had a great weekend spending time and celebrating our beautiful country with friends and family. Thank you for joining us online or in person as we gather together as one global church family. And I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to worship together. So however you're joining us, we'd like to welcome you to our worship gathering and can't wait to share some of the ways in which you can get involved with us over the next few weeks. Have you been praying and asking God about how you can be involved in serving at the People's Church? After two weeks of our We Serve event, we hope that you've had the opportunity to reflect and pray about where the Lord is calling you to serve with us. As you respond to where the Holy Spirit is prompting you, you can take the next step towards serving by signing up on thepeopleschurch.ca today. To explore a full list of our serving opportunities, text SERVE, S-E-R-V-E, in all caps, to 416-222-3341. We're calling kids in junior kindergarten through grade five. VBS is fast approaching. Occurring at the People's Church from August 8 to 12, kids will have the opportunity to grow their faith and learn how they can create a ripple effect in sharing God's love with those around them. Through crafts, worship, activities, and teachings, kids will discover how they can create an impact in ways they'll never forget through this year's theme entitled Make Waves. For more information and registration details, please visit thepeopleschurch.ca. Today, Mark and Marielle, along with a special guest, are back with a new update about our West Wing renovations. Church, it's time to worship together and hear God's word as we are inspired and challenged for God's global mission. Open doors and open arms where scripture forges faith, community builds family, and Christ in us makes us one. This is where I, I feel like I'm continuing to grow. I love the community here. I actually really like serving here as well. Honestly, my life has been transformed and by God under the teaching and the community of the people here. We found peoples and it felt like home when, when we came here. It's very nice to be welcomed in uh, in such a warm way. We are all on mission and to see everyone living missionally wherever they are in their workplaces, in their homes, in their neighborhoods has been life-changing. As we join together in God's global mission, we see the joy that the gospel brings. Feel the love that we all seek when we come to Him. Together we call the People's Church home. A home with a vision to be gospel-centered and globally engaged. Where we depend on the Spirit, Scripture, and a life of prayer. It's where generosity and partnerships are the catalyst to finding purpose and making a change. Where home is spoken in so many languages. A home where we join together across the globe in Jesus' name. So, no matter who you are, no matter your story, welcome home. Welcome, People's Church family. Good morning and greetings from Burlington, Ontario. We are Mark and Leanne Dart now, and we serve with SIM Canada, both here in Canada and in Burkina Faso, West Africa. We're so glad to be a partner in the gospel with all of you at People's Church, Toronto. To begin our worship service together, I will be reading from Isaiah chapter 12, verse five. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously let this be made known in all the earth. Let's praise and glorify the Lord together. Hey, good morning, church. Happy Canada Day weekend. Everyone proud to be Canadian today? Welcome to you at home. We are so glad that you are here with us celebrating this wonderful nation that God has blessed us with, but more so, we are here gathered in the name of Jesus to worship our great creator, amen? The one who formed us and knows us and has provided every good and perfect gift for us. So we're gonna start our time together just acknowledging uh, this great nation that God has put us here in for this season of life and for such a time as this. 
And we are going to continue after we sing our national anthem together in some songs of praise and worship. So could I invite you to stand to your feet if you are able and let's sing our national anthem, O Canada, together. today. Come on.
Amen. God, you are so good. You are so good. We love you, Lord. We worship you. You have done great things among us. But more than just what you've done, we worship you for who you are. We celebrate the name of Jesus today. All your people sing. All of the saints and angels bow before your throne. And all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and see you're worthy of it all yes you're worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory the saints and all the saints and angels bow before your throne yeah. and all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and say lift it up your Yeah. 
Yes.
still stand. Sing it out. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. Declare it. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Sing it one more time. Your promise. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. And I'm still in your hands, Lord. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet, and I never will forget. You never fail me yet. Sing that one more time. And I never will forget. You never. Some of us, um, some of us remember the year 2020. Does anyone remember that year? Anybody in the room? You at home? Anyone? Yeah. 2020. Yeah. What a year that was, huh? And uh, for many of us, that was a really hard year. And some of us are still experiencing hardship today. I'm not. I'm not trying to suggest that it was isolated to that year and that everything went back to being fine. But 2020 in particular, there was a lot going on in the physical realm, but also in the spiritual realm. And uh, at the end, towards the end of 2020, um, I, I'm not usually a super anxious person. Um, I grew up the son of an insurance agent. And so, you know, you think about what you're doing and don't take risks. <laughs> but... Um, Love you, Dad. But uh, but I wasn't super like anxious, anxious. But at the end of 2020, right around Christmas, actually, something came over me. I don't know how to really put words to it. But for those of you who've experienced anxiety, sometimes you just feel like this wave, and um, it feels like you're trying to come up for air. And sometimes you grab some air, but it feels like you're pulled under again. And so I was experiencing that around Christmas time, which is, you know, that's the time that time of year everyone's supposed to be joyful and happy, right? And I was having a hard time in that season. But the Lord continued to remind me who He is, who He always has been, and who He always will be. And I was drawn into His Word and into relationship with him in a way that when I look back on that really hard time, I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful for that, for that season because I was drawn in. I didn't run away. I drew closer to him. And the promise is that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because it's just a shadow. <laughs> it's not death, it's a shadow. And he has victory over death anyway, so you don't need to worry. But I walked through this season, and I remember there were some nights where it was just really, really scary for whatever reason. I couldn't understand why. But the Lord gave me this really simple song that ended up becoming um, a lullaby when I would lie down with my kids and try to get them to sleep at the end of a long day. And I'd sing it to them, but little did they know that I was not just singing it for them, I was singing it for myself. And um, I know that there are some of us in this place today and some of us at home who are walking through a really rough time. Um, and maybe there's a lot of fear in you for the future or fear for the circumstances that you, that you face. And I'm just here to encourage you to continue singing the truth, speaking the truth. Stand firm, resist the devil, speak the word of God, and he will flee. And I want to encourage you with this song. And um, 
Yeah, I'd love to teach you this really simple song today, if that's okay. It goes like this. The Lord is here. He loves me so. comes from Psalm 46. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. You need not fight. Just be still and he will fight your battles. And let's declare his praise in this song together. Sing. The Lord is here. Yeah, it's really simple. He loves me so. He loves me so. I will not fear. I will not fear. Be still and know. Can we sing it with a little more confidence this time? The Lord. The Lord is here. We declare it. The truth is that He loves me so, and I will not fear. And I will not fear. Be still and know. Let's sing that one more time. The Lord. promises are still true. We don't know how you will answer our prayers, but we know that you do answer, that you do hear us, that your Holy Spirit is in us, your people. And we need not fear the world. We need not fear chaos. We need not fear confusion, questions. You have us. You love us. We are yours. So Lord, I pray for each and every person as part of this gathering today. Lord, would you continue to speak and help us to hear. 
Help us to block out the distractions. To silence those things that are not of you. And tune in to your voice. To the truth. And we give you praise for who you are, for all you've done. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Church, we're going to continue to worship together, but please take your seats. We are so glad that we get to be together, that we get to gather like this. And there's some of you who are online, and we love that you're gathering with us for this time. But for those of you who are here, could you just maybe turn to someone beside you and just look at them and say, hey, I see you. Hey, I see you. Someone behind you, in front of you, around you. Look someone in the eye today. It's so good to be seen. If you're in the chat today, we see you as well. And it's just so good to be together. Well, if you are uh, here in the room and you came into our building today, you've probably noticed uh, that we are doing some renovations to this side of the building over here. We call it our West Wing. And um, there are no officials that live there or anything like that. It's just the west part of the building. And uh, God gave us this building in 1962. uh, The main part of this building was built. And um, we've had some different improvements and things over the years. But it came time for us to do some renovations for our children's ministry and other ministries in that part of our building. And God blessed us with the finances to do that. We're so grateful for that. But uh, we've been updating you as we've been going along through this renovation process, just so that we can celebrate all that God is doing on this journey among us. And we've got another installment of our videos today. So check out the screen and find out what's up. Hey church, I'm standing high above 374 Shepherd Avenue East, and more specifically, right above our main auditorium. The view from up here is amazing, and it just reminds me of how God has placed us right here in the middle of this community and this city. It also reminds me of the impact we can have as we share God's love to so many that move into this area from all over the world. Speaking of impact, right behind me is our West Wing, which has been under renovation for almost seven months. It will be the home of so many family ministries. It'll also be the place for community gatherings and partner events. Now, I didn't climb all the way up onto the roof to tell you that. We are up here to show you something specific, the West Wing roof. We have mentioned all throughout these renovation updates that it is our goal to keep you warm and safe and dry. We knew that our 60-year-old roof was in desperate need of repair and rebuild, and it has been one of our focuses during this renovation. Over the past few weeks, crews have been working in the heat and rain, early morning and into the evening to take away the old in preparation for the new. Waterproof membranes, sturdy framing, and strong platforms will not only meet the needs of our inside, but will also be more than adequate support for our new HVAC systems. Continue to pray for these teams as they work hard in the heat with heavy equipment so many feet off the ground. One of our other major priorities for this renovation is to make all floors and all spaces accessible. For example, there will be six brand new accessible washrooms, two on each floor. These six washrooms will be in addition to our standard washrooms and will give exclusive use to those with accessibility needs. Hey, we want to continue this conversation about accessibility, and Marielle is with a very special guest. Over to you, Marielle. Church, I'm here on our front lawns with our friend Vivienne Yu. Hi, Marielle. Hi. Vivienne, I know you are very intentional about loving and serving God and others. Could you tell us a little bit about how you do that? Sure. Thanks for asking, Marielle. And um, it has been a blessing. Since I came back to Toronto uh, five years ago, God has called me to serve at the Newcomers Network through the ESL class teaching, as well as the uh, life group. 
that I'm able to meet with every week and just have a Bible study. Mm. And it's just been great to do life together with them and to lean into God's Word together. So I really, really have been um, blessed with a lot of communities that God has placed around me. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Now, right here is a standard door threshold that most people would walk right over and never give a second thought. Bibian, can you tell us how a door threshold like this has changed your life after you were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis? Right. Um, so, like you said, before then, I took everything for granted. If I need to go to another room, I just go to another room. But once I became wheelchair bound because of my condition, I had to check and see, well, can I actually go there? Mm -hmm. So when I accept invitations to whatever events may be happening on the other side of the room, I need to check, okay, can I actually go? Um, and so the barriers have become a real thing for me. Yeah. I need to think about, you know, is it temperature controlled? Where I'm going? Is it really, a, is there an accessible bathroom? So there are a lot of things that um, we don't think about until we're in the situation. And so it's been an eye opener for me yeah. to just go, okay, I may not be able to go just because that, just because of that little piece of, right material. Right, so, of yeah. course. Your story is so eye-opening, Vivian. I definitely take my mobility for granted. But I'm so glad that we are renovating the West Wing and redesigning washrooms, elevators, and no door thresholds. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why I was very excited when I heard about the um, accessibility renovations in the West Wing, because that's going to open a whole new mm -hmm. world for a lot of people. And so it's just, it's just wonderful to hear about. Yeah. And I cannot wait to I'll be able to enjoy this time with the whole entire community together again. So, yes, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vivian, for sharing your story and your experience with us. Now, before we go, would you lead us in the time of prayer? Sure. Lord God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for alerting us to what we need to do better to love each other. And Lord, thank you for putting this on our hearts to renovate this West Wing so that it becomes truly accessible to the whole entire community, including those with mobility issues and any kind of disabilities. Lord, you love them so much, and I pray for every brother and sister who deals with mobility issues that um, you could be there for them so that they would stay strong and that they do not remain alone or isolated in any way. And Father, we just thank you so much for how Jesus shed his precious blood for all of us to have free access, barrier-free access to you, to your love, and to your hope that we all need so much right now. Thank you, Lord, for blessing the workers and blessing the schedule for how our, our renovations are going. Lord, we just pray that everything is going to work according to your will and your plan for all of us to welcome everyone and loving everyone. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Vivian, Thank you. for joining me today. Well, isn't that exciting? Great uh, progress in the development of the West Wing. And uh, I was thinking as we were talking about the physical development of uh, our church facility, but you know, the Lord is always at work building his church. That was Jesus' promise to his disciples, I will build my church. Well, that building process takes place every time we meet, every time we gather, when you interact with one another in your private times of prayer, the Lord is building his church. And that's something to be excited about. And speaking of being excited, somebody was so excited to get to the service this morning that they forgot to turn off their engine. So in the parking lot, this is the second time this has happened this morning, by the way. In the parking lot, there's a car, license number BVFH270. You'll need to go take care of that before one of our volunteers yields to the temptation to drive it off. <laughs> this is Canada Day weekend, and uh, we just uh, are so privileged, aren't we, as Canadians to live in this land? I want us to go to the Lord with uh, thanksgiving in our hearts, but also with supplication in our mind. Let's pray together. Father, we come today to you and uh, we acknowledge that you are a sovereign God. And Lord, we affirm that by 
stating what we believe as per John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and nothing that was made was made except by Him. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all people. And that light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And Lord, further on in that chapter, we're told that as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. That's us. You have given us your life. You have imparted to us that divine life. And Lord, from our lives, you desire that light to shine in our culture. And Lord, as we think of Canada today, we, uh, we are grateful for the spiritual moorings that we've had from our very foundation. But Lord, we understand also that through the years, through the decades, we veered off from the uh, spiritual moorings that were there at the beginning. And Lord, we've adopted vain philosophies and allowed our, our public policy, Lord, to be formulated on the basis of vain philosophies like secularism and humanism and consumerism. Lord, we pray that you will bring back through your church a realization, Lord, that your light shines from us and that, Lord, we would want that light to emanate from us at every corner of this nation. And we think of the so many peoples, Lord, and our and people's church itself as a representation of the Canadian mosaic. So many different people groups represented right here. We think of our indigenous believers, oh God, across the country. And we ask, O oh God, that there would arise a spiritual awakening within your people. And Lord, may it be a means of drawing many others of our Canadian brothers and sisters to the Lord, to the cross. And so, Lord, we, we reiterate the prayer that we sang earlier in the service. We believe, Lord, that you can do it again. We ask that you will do it again, that there come a great spiritual awakening, O oh Lord, from sea unto sea and from the river to the ends of the earth, according to your word. And Lord, let Canada lead nations, Lord, not just in a peaceful recognition as it has been known to be, but Lord, may Canada be a place where the Spirit of God and his anointing upon his people is changing the very complexion of our culture. May Jesus Christ in all his glory be raised, O Lord, in this land. And may the light of your glory shine from us, your people. This is your will, Lord, and we pray this today according to your will. Lord, as we uh, continue to fulfill our calling, our mandate, we think, Lord, of of two um, mission groups that are going out even this month, one today. We pray, Lord, for the uh, Kenya trip, the Kenya team that's going to the Mali children's family. We ask, O oh Lord, that not only will they provide medical services and other skills, but we ask that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit will be at work in and through them there in Kenya. For the Fong family, Lord, we pray that as they go to the, the Moccasin Club there in Saskatchewan, that they too will know the divine enablement of the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, elevating Jesus. And your word says that if Jesus Christ is lifted up, he will draw people to himself. Thank you for that assurance today. And we give you praise and thanksgiving because we can be part of that wonderful work, that process that you're doing. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Part of our involvement, of course, is giving. And, and we encourage you, as you have been doing, to give through various means. One is by texting People's Give to 77977, going on to our website, thepeoplesearch.ca. Or if you brought your offering today, that's wonderful, just drop it in one of the bins as you leave in the lobby. Thank you. Well, today we have, I was going to say a guest speaker, but he's no guest. He's part of our family. Constable Stevens Odege is our speaker today. <laughs> And you know, um, I said this earlier, and I mean it. Um, he actually was congregational life pastor for a number of years, right up to 2019. He felt the call of God to go to the police 
services of Toronto. So he is now a member of the Toronto Police Force. I don't know why God would do that to a person, but <laughs> <laughs> but I know that the, the call of God is upon this gentleman. And I want to say to you, Stevens, that before you joined, ever joined the Toronto Police Force, you were already one of Toronto's finest. Stop it. <laughs> Good morning, church. It's great. It's great to be here with you today. It's been a minute, uh, but it's great uh, to be here and to share God's word with you today. Um, have have ever you anybody here has ever been blessed that you receive an unexpected blessing? Somebody gave you something that you did not expect at all, and that uh, you got it. You're like, whoa! Anybody has ever been blessed? Yes. See if he has. Yes. 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 Um, let me tell you about a time when I was blessed. I remember I was in grade six. <clears throat> And I wanted a new pair of sneakers. And I remember like asking my parents, please, dad, I need a pair of sneakers. I need a pair of sneakers. I didn't want like the $20 pair for, you know, from the corner store. No, I wanted something nice. And I remember like hounding my parents. And the pair that I wanted were the Jordan 4 Retro Fire Red. I mean, it says in the name, those shoes were fire, okay? Those shoes were really like what everybody dreamed of. You know, I remember seeing the ad in the newspaper and I kind of cut out the ad, put some like scotch tape over it, put it on the fridge so that every day my dad would see that this is the pair of shoes that I wanted. So I remember after like months and months of me like hounding my dad, we went to uh, the, the shoe place and those Jordan Retros were $99.99, okay? And back in grade six for me, like $99, still till this day, $99 is still quite expensive for a pair of shoes, right? So I, I went to try on that $99.99 pair of uh, shoes, but unfortunately those were the kid size. Grade six, I had big feet. Therefore, I had to use the adult size, which were $139.99, right? That was, that was a lot of money. Still, it is a lot of money for today. That was like over 30 years or so ago. But man, when I got those kicks, the next day I was walking in school and you know, showing off my kicks, you know, because that was not something, I, although I wanted them, I never thought in my wildest dream that my dad would actually uh, get them for me. And today I want to explore uh, the life of somebody who actually got an unexpected blessing. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I will walk you through it uh, as the sermon goes along. Okay, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9. And at the time that 2 Samuel chapter 9 was written, David was on the top of his game. Okay, he had just uh, totally completely destroyed so many uh, different armies, whether it was the, uh, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, like anybody, any army that would step up against David, Dave, King David had them. You know, he completely uh, destroyed them. His renown was spread worldwide. The people would tremble at the thought of David coming nearby. Moreover, the Bible tells us that God's hand was upon him. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. Wherever he went, he had victory. All he did was win. And not only that, but whenever he won, he actually got to get all the plunder, all the stuff that people had. He actually got to keep it for himself and for his kingdom. So David had a lot of money. And I'm guessing that a few of us would probably uh, like to get a little bit of what uh, David had. As a matter of fact, uh, Patterson and Kim in their book uh, called The Day America Told the Truth uh, pulled a few people and they said, what would you be willing to do for $10 million? Okay, what would you be willing to do for $10 million? And here's, a, uh, here's some of the results. 25% of people polled says they would be willing to abandon their entire family. Okay, and tithe, so no mom, no dad, nobody for $10 million. Another 25 cents says they would abandon their church for $10 million. Now, if 25% of you are not here next Sunday, I will hound you out. Will and I will come to your place with the offering plate, make sure that you, you know, put your offering, okay? 16% of people says that they would leave their spouses. 10% said they would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. Uh, 7% says they would actually kill a stranger for $10 million. And 3% says they would actually put their child up for adoption 
for $10 million. I know some of like, oh, that's a good idea. No, you know, but I mean, this was not David's case, okay? As we've explored uh, throughout our missions conference, David was blessed, and he wanted to be a blessing to other uh, people. Therefore, uh, David uh, says in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9, verse 1, And David said, is there, any, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? The word here, the word here for kindness, uh, there's not an English word that actually translates. It's, it's the idea of, of loving kindness. In Hebrew, it's the word chesed. It's loving kindness. It's, it's this covenant love that God makes with his people that he expresses to his people. So it's, it's a love that you express to somebody that is close to you, somebody that you are in a relationship with, somebody that you're in, in a covenant with, somebody that if you express that love to them, if they're not part of your family, you would think that they're part of your family. Okay, Kellen was talking about COVID uh, back in, in 2020. Well, for me, this past Christmas, I actually happened to get COVID, okay? And I was, I was generous enough. I was blessed to be a blessing. I blessed my daughter with it. But my, my daughter and my wife didn't have it. It was kind of nice. You know, my daughter and I had room service and everything, whereas, you know, we, but we, I, I had COVID. So we usually go out to Montreal for Christmas to go visit our family, but I couldn't go this past Christmas because I had COVID. Wow. My mom, on Christmas Eve, cooked up a storm. Cooked and cooked. The whole day, she cooked up a storm. Early Christmas Day, she took her car with her sister, my auntie, and they drove all the way from Montreal to Toronto, dropped us tons and tons of food, stayed for about an hour or so, and drove all the way back to Montreal. Now, that, yes, I know. Aw, yeah, I know. That's chesed. That's love. That's this kind of love that David wanted to express to somebody. And, he, uh, and one may wonder, why did he want to express that to somebody in, uh, in Saul's household? See, you got to understand that when David defeated Goliath, everybody got excited for David. You're right? go, David, it's your birthday. Everybody got excited. Everybody was cheering on for David. King Saul was not very happy about that. So King Saul went on a hunt to kill uh, David. Imagine being on, uh, for 10 years of your life, you are just, you know there's a bounty on your head and people, somebody's like chasing after you constantly. It's, it's kind of like the feeling that when you're driving and you see those red and white lights, you know, behind you that, you know, sometimes it might be me, who knows. But you know, it, it, it's kind of like that, that, that feeling that you get, this is what David had for 10 years over and over and over. And at one point, things got better between David and King Saul to the point of where King Saul says, you know what, do you want to marry my daughter, Mirab? And David's like, yes, I would love to marry your daughter. So David gets ready. It's an open bar, so all the guests are happy, getting their dancing shoes on. And they, they come to the wedding, they come to that day. And on that day, King Saul takes his daughter back and gives her to somebody else. David goes back, and, and being on the hunt, he's trying to hide. But Jonathan uh, helped uh, David escape from Saul's murderous plot. And David made this covenant for the rest of his life that he would treat anybody from Jonathan's household with love. And we can see that in 1 Samuel 20, verse 14 and 15. So remembering this covenant that uh, David had made, uh, that he had made with Jonathan, David asked in verse, uh, in verse 3, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him. So it's not just that David was nice, oh, I'm such a nice guy, let me bless somebody else. No, but it's, it's God's kindness that he wants to show. God had made a covenant with, uh, with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he would establish his throne forever. Therefore, David wanted to bless other people with the kindness that he had received from God. So David continues, uh, the, he says, Zib, Ziba, the servant, said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. And what the servant Ziba is saying here is he's, he's crippled, man. He's, he's not fit to be part of this. And his name is Mephibosheth. Repeat after me, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Early on, said we were saying when you say Mephibosheth, someone's like, "Bless you, you know, Mephibosheth, bless you, you know." But yeah, Mephibosheth is the name of this gentleman, and he was crippled in both feet. How did he become crippled? The Bible tells us in Second Samuel chapter four that there was a war going on, and then one day both King Saul and Jonathan, his son, died. So Mephibosheth, who was the grandson of King Saul and the son of Jonathan, and one day lost both his dad and his grandpa. 
And back in those days, it was fairly uh, normal. It was highly likely that the enemy would come and complete the victory by killing the whole, uh, all of Saul's family. So sensing this threat, the nurse grabs then five-year-old Mephibosheth and tries to run away with him. And as he's running away with him, she drops him and she drops and he becomes crippled in both feet. Now, little Mephibosheth now can't play soccer anymore. No more scholarships for him. Little Mephibosheth is is stuck now. He can't play with with all the other kids, like people who are playing, because he is crippled in both feet. And then like our society where there's a lot of accommodation, back then there were no wheel trans or no uh, electric scooter or anything uh, of that sort. You know, when you were, when you had some sort of physical ailment like that, you brought, you, you were not only a burden to your family, but you actually brought shame to your family. As a matter of fact, the name Mephibosheth means son of shame, the, the shamed one. And it might be a name that they actually gave him after he was born, but that was his name. And there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is saying, I done something bad. Shame is saying, I am bad. I'm so unworthy. This is what shame does uh, to you. Even though he was a prince, he didn't have his own house. He lived with a friend, Matt Makir, in Lodabar. And Lodabar is like in the middle of nowhere. It actually means a place, the place of not, the place of, 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 of drought. There's absolutely nothing there. Like you do not want to be from Lodabar. In my Haitian culture, where you're from determines your status. Okay, if you're from a certain place, oh, you're from a certain, certain place. But if you're from some other place, ooh, okay, you, you don't want to meet enemy from uh, such and such place. Imagine, you know, your, your home, a little daughter brings her a new boyfriend. Mom, here's John. He's a doctor at the hospital in town. Oh, wow, how much the old oh, make six figures? And here's his car. Oh, wow, it's great. Oh, let's sit down, have a seat, you know. And where are you from? You're from Little Bar. All of a sudden, dinner is done. You get out of, there's nobody from Lodabar that will step into this house, okay? um, Because you don't want to be uh, from there. But that's not how uh, King David saw Mephibosheth. Verse uh, 4 and 5, this is what David says, where is he? And Ziba, the servant, said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then the king David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Now, you have to put yourselves in Mephibosheth's shoes, okay? He was probably laying around in some sort of, like, dirt, uh, dirt room in the back of the house, and he could barely move. And all of a sudden, he hears all this noise, you know, all the, the a caravan of people and, and the trumpets and, and all the noise. Because you, you, this never happened at Lodabar. Nobody ever comes to Lodabar. There's absolutely nothing to do at Lodabar. Reminds me of the time that I went to school in Regina, Saskatchewan. There's absolutely nothing to do there. Nobody ever comes like this in Lodabar. And I don't know if you've uh, seen the movie Coming to America. The, the, this, remember when, when, when the king, King Jaffe Jofer, comes to America, to New York, and comes to, to find his son, and you see the, the pedals and, and the drums and, and the trumpets and, and royalty and, and the big cars. This is what was happening right now. Okay, this, this big royalty is here at Lodabar. And not only that, they're here, but they stop in front of the house of Makir. Okay? Knock, knock. Okay, let's try that again. Knock, knock. King David. You don't say King David who. You know who King David is. Nobody would ever say King David who. It's King David who. Okay? Because if King David sent his servant to your house, you know that you're in trouble. You know, this is when the principal comes to your classroom and knocks on the door and is like, you, I want to see you in my office. The whole rest of the class is like, whoa, you're in trouble. And this is exactly what was happening to Mephibosheth right now. Like, Mephibosheth, they're asking for you, bro. Man, it was nice to meet you, man. Have a nice life. You're you're done. And Mephibosheth is probably wondering, like, why why are they coming for me? I'm I'm just a a crippled man. Like, I'm I'm nothing. I've I've been dropped. I'm, I'm completely worthless. And some of us may feel like that this morning. Some of us may feel that we've been dropped. Maybe we have a physical condition that reminds us that we're different, that makes us feel like we've been dropped. Maybe we've got some mental health issues or we have some sort of an addiction that reminds us that we've been dropped. Maybe our, our boss dropped us and picked somebody else for the promotion. Maybe our significant other dropped us for somebody else. 
Maybe our, 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 our kids dropped us. Maybe our parents dropped us to pick another a sibling. But the king summons us at his table. The king summons us at his table. And Mephibosheth doesn't know why. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know that years before, King David and his daddy had made a deal that they would treat each other in in a covenant of love. He doesn't know any of that. Because in those days, it was common for the new king to kill the rest of the family so that no other other challenger to the throne could, could be a threat to the throne or to his kingdom. So he thinks it's done. And for him, that's a trigger. Because remember the, the first time that the enemy came, that's how he became, that's how he became crippled, right? This is a, a trauma for him. This is a, a situation that triggers his trauma. And when our trauma is triggered, usually we have three reactions. Unless you get serious therapy, we have three reactions. Fight, flight, or freeze. Well, he can fight. He cannot flight. So he freezes and says, okay, might as well go with them. And on his way there, he's probably making his mind up as as what he could tell to King David not to get killed. And it's a long trip, but a journey's uh, a day's worth. He's trying to come up with stories as to, okay, what can I tell? And this reminds me of of when I was in grade three and I got suspended from school from, it wasn't my fault, I'm telling you, it wasn't my fault, it was Philip's fault, but I got suspended for one day. And I remember that day on my way home, I was trying to come up with stuff to tell my mom, okay, what am I going to tell my parents to try to soften the blow, right? And I came up with a great plan, don't say anything. So the next morning, my mom wakes me up, Steven, don't wake my brother and I have Steven, it's time to go to school. So I'm like, mom, I ain't going to school. She's like, why aren't you going to school? I got suspended. Right there on my bed, I got my first spanking of the day, right there on my bed. Okay, and then she wants to know exactly what happened. So we go to school, she talks to the principal, the principal tells her exactly what happened. We come back home, and I get another spanking, because now she has the whole truth as to what had happened. And then she says those words that I never wanted to hear as a kid, wait until your dad gets home. (laughs) My dad got home, and I got a third spanking that day. Lena says I never got suspended again, okay? I'm, I'm okay, I turned, out, I turned out okay, but never got spanking, never got suspended again. And Mephibosheth here probably thought that it was not just a spanking that he was going to get, but he thought that this was the end, he is going to die. He probably, he went, paid homage to David, kind of bowed down, waiting for David to probably take a machete and just chopped off his head, but this is not what happened. Verse uh, 7 tells us, this is what David tells us, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, John. Jonathan. And David is like, no, no, Mephibosheth is like, don't you understand? Don't, don't you know who I am? I mean, I'm hurt. I'm crippled. I can, I can barely walk. I mean, I've been crawling through my life. Mephibosheth had no idea that this, this deal, this covenant that David and, and Jonathan made, that he right now was going to be the recipient of this love, the recipient of this chesed, the recipient of, of this love that David wanted to uh, display uh, to Jonathan, to, uh, to Mephibosheth. It's this kind of love that, with which God loves his people. It's this kind of love with which God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the kind of love that David wanted to display. See, for Mephibosheth, it wasn't just his feet that was crippled, but he felt like, his, like he, all of them were crippled. He tells to David, what is, what is your servant that you should show regards for, regard for a dead dog, su- dead dog such as I? Like, I'm absolutely nothing. And when Mephibosheth said those words, like that cut David deep. Because a few years before, when David was uh, running away from King Saul, at one point King Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself. David kind of cuts the helm of his robe. And David pipes up afterwards and tells, kills, why are you running after me? I'm like a dead dog. 
the exact same words that Mephibosheth is using right now. See, David understands what it feels like to be in despair. David understands what it, what it feels like to fear for your life. David understands what it feels like uh, to, to, to be crippled. He understands that, you know, when we mess up and mess up and mess up again, he understands. And this is the kind of king that we serve. Hebrews 4 verse 15 tells us that we have a high priest who is not unable to sympathize, sympathize with our weaknesses. And from now on, David will not treat Mephibosheth according to his past, but he will treat Mephibosheth according to this covenant love that he's made with his dad. And David wants to express this love in two ways. By uh, blessing him physically, both physical blessing. He tells in verse 7, I will restore to you all the land of Saul, King Saul, your father. And Mephibosheth is probably like, you no know, crawling over, looking outside the wind. It's like, whoa, all this land, it's all yours. And we've seen from history, when you take land from people, whether it's on this side or the other side of the border, when you take land from people, you, you reduce their ability to, to reproduce wealth, to be a self-sustaining. So by restoring this wealth, this land to, uh, to Mephibosheth, David is actually giving him now independence. He's giving him generational wealth. He's giving him the ability to be self-sustaining. He's giving him back a sense of identity by restoring this land to him. But my civil servant probably saying, you know what? I'm, I'm crippled. How am I going to take care of all this land? David says, I got you, bro. I got you. And all who live in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. Mephibosheth had uh, 20, 15 sons and 20 servants. All those now are at the mercy of little Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth says, you know what? I'm not from around here. I'm from Lodabar. And King David tells, no, no, no. You're not going to go back to Lodabar. You are going to stay here from now on. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem. No longer back home. No longer back in Lodabar. No longer back in some dirt house. No, he lives in Jerusalem in the presence of the king. Not only did David bless him uh, physically, but he wanted to give him some spiritual blessing. He says in verse 10, But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Did, did you catch the salty here? It's no longer Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of the grandson of King Saul. It's no longer Mephibosheth from Lodabar who lives with Machir. It's no longer uh, Mephibosheth, the one who uh, feels like he's like a dead dog. No, no, no. We're talking about Mephibosheth, the grandson of David. Not only is he the grandson of David, it says in verse 11, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's son. It's not just a grandson, but, but David, something happened where David adopted Mephibosheth into his family. And four times in those verses, 1 to 13, do we read that he ate at the king's table. And Charles Swindle says this beautifully, and the tablecloth of grace covered his feet. And the tablecloth of grace covered his feet. See, now he will break bread with the king. He will commune with the king. He will forever be in a relationship with the king. And when I look at this story, I can't help but think that we are all like Mephibosheth. We are, we're all enemies of the king. We've been dropped so many times. We were crippled by sin and cannot walk in his ways. Yet, Jesus, our king, sought us help. See, Mephibosheth didn't trek all the way. No, no, no. King David went and picked him up. Jesus came down. See, Titus 3, verse 4 says, But when the goodness and the loving kindness, this chesed, this love of God, our Savior, appeared... He saved us, not because of works that done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. He paid the price on the cross so that we could be reconciled with our heavenly father. He adopted us into his family. He summons us at his table. He treats us not according to our sin, not according to our past. No, no, no. He treats us according to what Christ has done on the cross, according to his covenant love. He says, I got you. No matter what your past may be like, I got you. Now that's my king. That's the kind of king that I serve. Do you know him? 
Do you have a seat at the table with this king? See, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe that if you're here this morning, you didn't just stumble upon this place, but I believe that this king wants to extend this invitation to you. And maybe you're here this morning, and you are not, you're not part of this table, and you would like to be part of the king's family. I would like to pray. And if that's your desire, I will ask you to repeat after me. So let's bow our hand. I will pray. Bow our heads and I will pray. And it's not that your desire, that you want to be part of the king's family, just repeat after me. You don't have to do it out loud. You can do it in the quietness of your heart. King Jesus, I come before you. And I recognize that I'm crippled by sin. I recognize that there's nothing that I can do that can make me draw closer to you. And I thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. I thank you that you're summoning me to your table and that I can enjoy a a relationship with you forever. Change my heart. Cause me to love you. Cause me to live with you. And cause me to enjoy you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you said that prayer, there will be some uh, prayer counselors after the service that would love to connect with you, that would love to chat with you. And you saying that prayer does not mean now that everything's going to be like lovey-dovey, you know, you're going to come out of here and all of a sudden, you know, all your problems are going to be gone. No, no, not at all. If uh, those of us who are followers of Christ, we know that being followers of Christ does not mean that, you know, everything is, is lovey-dovey. As a matter of fact, look at the last verse of this uh, that we'll examine today. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he always ate at the king's table. He enjoyed this relationship with the king. For the rest of his life, you know, they were talking about strategy and he was there at the king's table looking in. But the very last verse, now he was lame in both feet. He didn't get physically healed. He didn't get miraculously healed. That being said, he enjoyed the presence of the king. But there will come a day, friends, there will come a day, where, a day where there will be no more crippled feet. There will be no more sin. There will be no more sorrows. No more pain in this world. There will come a day where we will live with the king forever. And until that day comes, friends, let us be thankful that the king summoned us at his table. And let's enjoy the presence of the king forever. Let me pray. King Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that wherever, whatever Lord of Bar we find ourselves in, you are seeking us out. You sought us out and you invited us at your table. Thank you that you uh, desire to have a relationship with us. Even though we've messed up over and over again, you are faithful. And I pray that we'll continue to enjoy your presence, that we'll continue to enjoy the privileges of being with you at your table. Cause us to love you, cause us to serve you, and cause us to walk in your ways. I thank and I praise in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you so much, Stevens, for that uh, challenging and encouraging word today. But we've got something to take into our week as we interact with uh, those in our neighborhood and those in the workplace, those in our family. This is a wonderful word that we in humility can be emanators of the grace of God and invite others to the table where we are privileged to sit week after week, day after day. Well, this has been a wonderful day in the uh, presence of the Lord as we worship together. Those of you that um, have joined us online, we're encouraging you to stay with us for the next, uh, actually until one Eastern time. You can interact with our staff and ask questions that you might have or have prayer requests answered. Those of you that are here at the auditorium, uh, maybe the Lord has spoken to your life today and uh, you're in a time of contemplation and needing perhaps to express that to others. We have a prayer team that will be here in the auditorium and be willing and anxious to pray with you. All you need to do is stay where you're seated and we will come to you. Uh, Those of you that will be exiting or leaving, 
Uh, we ask that you not rush away. Please uh, find opportunities to connect with one another. That's, that's a marvelous idea. But make sure you do it in the hallways, the lobby, or outside, because this becomes kind of a, a prayer sanctuary for the next few minutes. Well, the, uh, the fact is this has been just a wonderful kind of in injection into our Canada Day weekend. And so what we're asking you to do is make sure that you enjoy the rest of Canada Day. Have a wonderful week. God bless. Mm -hmm.